Welcome everybody. My name is Knut Detlefsen and I represent the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And today we're going to have an event on how the response to COVID-19, the pandemic that moves us all, that has turned around the world and how we deal with politics, has revealed maybe weaknesses in our so social safety nets and how social democrats across the Atlantic are discussing that and how we're going to overcome those shortcomings. The Friedrich Ebert Foundation is a global uh, social democratic network. It's a German political foundation that tries to connect social democrats and progressives around the world to come up with uh, innovative policy solutions and make us stronger as a political movement. And our office in Washington DC works in North America, uh, that means in the US and Canada, and we try to build a progressive transatlantic dialogue. And today we have two great participants, uh, Andrea Horwath, who is a leader for the Canadian Social Democrats, who is the official opposition leader in Ontario and leads the, our sister party there. And we have Katarina Bale, who is a German and European leader for the Social Democrats. She was a cabinet minister. She was a secretary general for the German Social Democrats and is now the vice president of the European Parliament and also, of course, a member of such. And I look forward to this very important discussion in our digital series that we are doing now. So I hope we're gonna have a very interesting and candid discussion and I turn it over to my wonderful colleague Jordan who helps us organize and represent the Friedrich Hebert Foundation in Canada. Thank you so much, Knut. Um, this is a, certainly a really great opportunity to make sure that we're building on that dialogue uh, between Germany and Canada. And so today, I'd like to begin the conversation with a, a bit of a general question. COVID-19 has really shaken the foundations of a lot of the social safety nets all around the world. And we have seen it reveal that it is not maybe in fact an equal opportunity crisis, but one that deepens in existing inequalities. So I was hoping, and, and maybe we'll start with you, Katerina, uh, that we could talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your work and what gaps in the social safety net this crisis has revealed and how that's impacting ordinary people. Uh, in the European Union at the moment, we're focusing quite a lot on what's happening within the Union, but it is so important to look um, overseas and to see how what is happening elsewhere, to learn from one another. And um, because of the structure of the European Union, of course, we are probably facing more inequalities in the first place than, for example, a country like Canada or others, um, because we have very, very different member states. In that the ability to cope with the crisis of course, was very different and has impacted um, the population uh, very differently. We have seen that um, those countries who were particularly hit by the crisis were those who had been hit by the financial crisis before the worst. And that may be the reaction, this is my interpretation, um, the reaction by the European Union in the austerity that was imposed to these countries because they had to, for example, cut um, the fundings of their health system. So, uh, so, and we have great unemployment rates in these youth and employment, especially in these countries. So um, the, the families live closer together. The young people stay a lot longer with their parents and grandparents, which also worsen the situation. So we have inequality in the first place, social inequality in the first place. We have different possibilities of the countries reacting to it. And Germany has, has released a huge safety package with, with also social um, benefits. Um, we have, for example, already seen in the last crisis um, compensation for, um, uh, for shortening your working time, um, then the state compensates. Um, we uh, see that um, a lot of other measures are being taken, which is not everywhere the case. I think globally is that women are affected more than men, as well as the crisis itself concerns, as the, um, the, um, the responsibility to, to cope with it. I mean, it's, it's mothers, uh, it's uh, caretakers, it's, it's, it's nurses, it's, um, 
so so we have an inequality between men and women. We see that we have a solidarity in the meantime between member states. Education, uh, there we are very concerned because the kids that, um, because of homeschooling for so long, of course the kids from um, households that are better off have even better chances now. And the ones that are not so well off, um, who are, don't have maybe so sophisticated digital devices, um, uh, they, this, this gap is widening even more. So we have lots of issues um, concerning the COVID crisis and social issues. And I think that there are some themes there that are really resonant. And Andrea, maybe you could speak particularly to how this crisis has deepened uh, or, or made worse some of the existing cuts and the impacts of austerity. I know this is something that we're dealing with in Ontario, uh, as well as the challenges around education and caregiving. And then thanks very much for uh, organizing this uh, this talk. I think it's uh, it's a great opportunity to to do exactly that to kind of identify where there's some commonalities in terms of the impact of COVID-19, uh, you know, from from the perspective of Ontario and Canada, uh, and to kind of look at what's happening in the European Union and, and get a sense of how we're all trying to. To, to deal with that as social democrats and I can say that in Ontario um, with the conservative government in place uh, tragically what what uh, what what happened to us is that the conservative government was literally starting to dismantle our public health system uh, at the very time that the uh, covid-19 um, pandemic hit hit our province and so uh, we've uh, we've not had the kind of response that other provinces have been able to put together our government has been very uh, the conservative government very slow to act uh, very uh, mixed in its messages uh, very um, it's been very challenging uh, because they have also not been willing uh, as fiscal conservatives that they are they're, they're just not willing to use uh, you know Ontario funds or Ontario public funds to do anything really to help shore people up. So while the federal government has provided some overall programs uh, in Ontario, uh, we haven't seen the government here step up to, to do anything really to, to provide direct help to people. And so where other provinces have, uh, for example, almost immediately uh, provided uh, some income support for folks, not so in Ontario, of course. Then the federal programs rolled out uh, and uh, still Ontario hasn't done anything to help everyday people with their ability to pay the bills. And of course, folks have lost jobs. So just as Katerina was saying, the same thing here in, here in Ontario are, are um, you know, the, the people hit hardest, of course, are women, uh, but also gig economy workers. And so people, the first businesses to close down were um, restaurants and bars and entertainment uh, and uh, those kinds of sectors and, and so those uh, fo folks are largely you know the y younger people uh, more tr uh, more uh, precarious workers uh, so so that was one piece these are also folks who then couldn't pay their rent uh, and in, in big cities like Toronto and other big cities it's it's become quite troubling to see that the um, provincial government has not helped in that regard uh, there's been a commitment around um, you know, not allowing anybody to be evicted, but there is no legislation, really. There's a moratorium on evictions, but many tenants now are, of course, uh, gathering up uh, months and months of arrears of rent. And the government is now, at this moment, primed to, to change the law so that a, a landlord can evict a tenant in arrear. If a tenant has put together a, an agreement with the landlord, on you know, on arrears and a repayment plan. If they breach that plan, uh, they can be evicted immediately for breaching the plan, which is just, it's going so far backwards in terms of uh, housing security and, and tenants' rights. But I mean, that's just tenants. The same thing with landlords. We've been asking the government as Social Democrats, let's let's shore people up. Let's give people the, the uh, some rent assistance. Let's shore up our small business sector and, and give some commercial rent assistance and, and really uh, help us get through it so that when we get to the other side, the damage won't be as deep uh, for individuals and families uh, or for, uh, for businesses, particularly SMEs. But of course, they're, they're a conservative government, so we haven't seen any of that. And of course, all of the same things Katerina talked about in terms of uh, ki children, kids, and, and the education system, we still don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, and the inequities, interestingly enough, in, in our province are, are, I mean, it's not dissimilar 
except that we have parts of our province that literally don't even have access to the internet, uh, where there is no broadband, like where, you, where kids can't, cannot even, um, you know, log on to do any kind of uh, uh, e-learning or, or uh, distance learning. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, the inequities are quite, quite troubling. And again, in some areas, the school boards have been able to find resources for uh, uh, less well-off children, for, for low-income kids. Uh, in other areas, school boards have not been able to do that. And the, and the government of Ontario, of course, hands off as they are, uh, was not prepared to step up and, and, uh, and help with that either. So there, there, and these are the kinds of things that are going to cause lasting problems uh, for, for families and for people. Child care is a big issue here. Uh, we don't have a universal child care program. Our child care centers have been told they can reopen, but they've been given no support from the government to reopen. Uh, and of course, they're going to have much, many, many fewer children uh, than in, in past uh, in past years and so so really what's happening is that the child care system that was already fragmented and a patchwork type of system is is literally falling apart and, and the government uh, has no interest in whatsoever in shoring it up or in make, making sure that uh, uh, that the centers the, the child care centers get what they need uh, to provide that important service and so what does that mean it means once again most of those ECEs early childhood educators are women so those jobs are going to be gone but also how are how are we, how are families going to you know replenish their income and get back into the workforce if there's no child care available and in the other at the other end when people are saying well september is coming kids will go back to school that's not really happening it's one of the things that the government's talking about is that um is that they'll they'll perhaps have alternating days of school well if there's no child care and there's alternating days of school, then who is it that's going to be taking care of the children on those alternating days, uh, child, uh, ch uh, school age children? Well, of course, it's going to be women. So, so we're going to go into a deep economic uh, crisis. We're already in it. Uh, we're certainly looking at a, a significant constriction of, uh, uh, of growth and, and so, so our GDP. And so then what do we do? Um, we end up putting women on the front lines of that hardship. So it's gonna, there will, will be no recovery without a she recovery is what we're saying. It's definitely gonna be a she session. But the idea that some governments are using this crisis as an opportunity to roll back rights. And I know that we're seeing that manifest in the European Union uh, and we're seeing it in Ontario in some different ways with workers. But maybe Katerina, could you talk briefly about what you're seeing in Europe? We do see a rollback also uh, in the European Union. Um, yeah, it's, it's like Andrea said, every government uh, shows now its true face, as we say in German. Um, it, it, uh, the ones that always wanted to cut down workers' rights now try to do so. The ones who are not interested in women's rights um, now uh, pick upon that. And um, another aspect that I would like to introduce, because it's my, my field of, of interest, um, is the rule of law and democracy. We are seeing countries, um, especially the, I have to say, usual suspects, Poland and Hungary, who are taking advantage of the crisis to, um, uh, to uh, abolish democratic standards, to change uh, election laws, to, um, to um, abolish the, the separation of, of powers and the independence of justice even more, to restrict the freedom of media, so um, it's not only Poland and Hungary, it's, it's also other countries, but this is extremely disturbing because, I mean, the European Union being uh, as complicated as it is, you, you do have, you, you do need common values that you agree upon. And, and if you have member states that uh, infringe these or that, uh, that that say openly that they are not interested in, uh, in keeping, for example, an independent justice, um, then, um, then you're in real trouble. So yes, we have seen uh, governments taking advantage of the crisis and um, uh, we are starting into the German presidency on the 1st of July and, and we all hope that this presidency will be able to um, back this development down. Andrew, could you touch a, a little bit briefly on how workers' rights in Ontario have been impacted by the crisis and by the Ford government's decisions? 
Well, you know, it's it's very frustrating here in Ontario because we are we are headed in a backwards direction on so many levels. Uh, but with workers, particularly, I mean, the former Liberal government here in Ontario, uh, which which was um, which lost power two years ago, pretty much, uh, they uh, made some some very um, I would say small steps uh, towards more workers' rights in uh, in our province. Um, under great pressure, I think, trying to save their political bacon, more or less. But uh, but at the end of the day, what they what we ended up with was uh, at least a couple of days of paid sick day, for example. I'm going to use that one as an example, so that people could take two paid sick days off. Uh, we were asking uh, we were asking for much more than that, obviously. Uh, but the Liberals landed on only two days, so you could take more days off unpaid, but two days of of paid uh, sick day. Of days uh, without losing your job. Uh, the Conservative government came into office and immediately took, rolled back any of those gains or any of those uh, achievements that uh, had been uh, won under the previous government. So we go into a pandemic uh, where Ontarians are not protected uh, to take time off when you're sick. I mean, in, in fact, it, the government rolled things back so, so badly here in Ontario that they actually went back to to decades ago when you used to have to present a, a sick note to your uh, to your employer from your physician to prove that you were off sick legitimately. So, so even taking time off sick uh, was not something that was where your job was protected uh, unless you could bring a sick note in to, um, to prove that, which, which every health agency and health expert around the world uh, has identified as, is just, it's just bad policy. It's bad but it's bad public health policy. Uh, so of course we go into a pandemic and, and you know, people, people don't have any opportunity to take sick time off. Uh, and, and we've been pushing of course to reinstate paid sick days. And we've used this kind of opportunity that the pandemic has, has once again highlighted uh, that people need to be able to not bring their illnesses into the workplace and to then spread that illness through the workplace and to potential you know, customers and clients, depending on what kind of a workplace it is, uh, as well as co-workers and uh, employers. And so, I mean, th this is one example of, uh, of the erosion of workers' rights. Uh, but um, the other thing that's been highlighted now here in Ontario very recently uh, is workers who never had any rights. So we have migrant workers here who come, of course, from, uh, uh, from Mexico and other countries to help with the farming uh, of our crops. We have, you know, an, an amazing agricultural sector, but it's being held up by workers who are, have, who have very few rights. Uh, and now COVID-19, because these workers live on farms in congregate living settings, uh, is ravaging, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the farms. And, uh, uh, and we've had three deaths of migrant workers now in, uh, in Ontario. But the, the reason being is because Nobody bothered, the government didn't bother uh, to make any um, attempts at, uh, at, at ensuring that those uh, types of workplaces and those types of settings were going to be safe and, were, and people were going to be distanced and there was going to be any kind of, uh, there was nothing put in place for testing or for isolation or, or anything at all. And so, of course, now these, these workers are at great risk and, uh, and our food supply is at great risk. Uh, and what it really highlights is that we have been I mean, they, these workers have pretty much, you know, been exploited for, you know, as, as part of our, I mean, it's structurally, I mean, it's part of our, our uh, agricultural sector. And, and so there's a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of um, identification of the, the, uh, uh, the way these workers have been treated uh, over time. I don't, unfortunately, think that there's going to be much change, though, not with this government. Yes, and I know that that's an issue uh, that has also come up in Germany, which is uh, migrant workers and rights and, and dealing with COVID within that community. Um, so I'm going to move us now to a, to a slightly more forward-looking part of the discussion. And I'll start with you, Andrea. What I'm, what I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about is very briefly, as we're looking forward as progressives, how do we need to be rebuilding? What are the things that you're working on um, so that we can rebuild better and that this crisis, uh, you know, isn't just something that's hitting ordinary people and leaving them behind, but is perhaps an opportunity to change some of the systems that we see are now not meeting people's needs. So I'll, I'll start with you, Andrea, on that. 
Sure, well, absolutely, and, and thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, you know, one of the things um, that we were uh, doing, that New Democrats were doing, we, we had uh, been working on the, uh, what we called the Green New Democratic Deal, uh, which is the, you know, the changing of our economy to a green economy. Uh, we had some, uh, we had put together a, a, a paper, if you will, uh, a broad consultation ensued, uh, and we were at the, um, at the point of actually you know, launching our plan for, for a just recovery and a green recovery uh, when COVID hit. I mean, literally, we were going to release it in April. So what this is, what COVID has done then is, has given us a, a really a, an imperative to kind of step back uh, and look at how now do we, uh, do we, you know, do we change our perspective on our Green New Time Democratic deal to uh, to try to incorporate uh, some of the things we've been talking about around you know around you know not just the green economy but a green economy where uh, where you know where where people are at the center of everything that's happening right and where we have more equality and we have better uh, wages and we have you know a distribution of wealth that that's m much more just and uh, and and so we we were actually we pulled it back now. And we're sending it back out for further consultation uh, to, um, you know, to, to hone that uh, into a document that's more reflective of some of the lessons we've learned here in uh, in Ontario around COVID. But uh, in particular, you know, gig economy workers and and part-time workers and the precarity of of work. Uh, but but I do want to say that one of the things we've we've learned uh, is also in our healthcare system where the gaps are uh, and some of our most um, you know, important workers in our healthcare system who have been overlooked as well in terms of their quality of work and their wages. And, and so our long-term care system, and I know this has happened in, in many, many other countries, uh, are, uh, was very fragile. It was, in, it was in a crisis in the first place. Uh, but of course, COVID ravaged the uh, long-term care system. Uh, and we, you know, we now call our personal support workers, uh, you know, the folks that day in and day out uh, you know, work to keep our loved ones safe and, and you know, provide for their needs in long-term care. We, we, we now call them heroes, but they are part-time workers. They're workers that don't have benefits largely and, 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 uh, and don't have full-time work. And so they travel amongst various uh, uh, facilities. And so, so there's, and they're mostly women and they're mostly racialized women. Right. And so we are we're really working on, on that as well and trying to overhaul long term care as is uh, because it needs to be overhauled. This is an opportunity to do that, but also to acknowledge and recognize, you know, who is it in, in that system and not just that system. But of course, uh, clerks in grocery stores, for example, uh, uh, folks that work in pharmacies. I mean, there's a lot of people who kept working while others were not working uh, in order to, to keep our communities uh, going. Uh, and all of these folks are the lowest paid workers. And so those workers then go home to their families and not, not dissimilar to what Katrina was saying earlier. Uh, in, lots of times they're larger families, they're in suburban communities where, where the cost of living is a little bit lower than in the, main, in the big cities. Uh, but now, you know, where we see there's still hotspots of COVID-19 in, uh, in our province, those are the areas where those, um, where those hotspots exist, where those lower wage workers live right so there's a whole piece around that um and as i already talked about the, the other big issue is around child care what can we do coming out of covid 19 to really step up and make sure that we have a child care system that um uh, that serves the needs of, of families and children it's so critical thanks andrea and, and uh, katrina maybe if i can turn it over to you I, I feel like some of the themes that andrea was talking about related to green recovery connect up well with the work that you've been doing in Europe. Would you be able to talk a little bit about that? Well, the situation there is quite similar. Uh, we were heading for the New Green Deal, as we call it, um, in, in the European Union. And um, I hope that we can actually keep it up. Um, it is at least the will of the Commission and the Parliament, two out of three of the major institutions. Um, that we do so um, because now we are seeing great amounts of money being released um, to to battle uh, the consequences of the COVID crisis and and they are supposed to be linked to um, to the priorities that we set before the crisis which was the new green deal 
climate, uh, climate protection and, and sustainability, but also a digital um, development. I mean, we, we also have um, areas where, where you barely have internet access, um, but also social rights. And here, I think we really have to understand this crisis also as a chance. Um, it, it does lay open the problems that we had before. And it is about, um, as Andrea said, it's about the care sector. They are, they are uh, not paid enough. Uh, their working conditions are not good enough. Um, the Social Democrats uh, believe that it is too much profit orientized. It should be a public sector in public interest. The, the gender pay gap is one issue that can be tackled on the European level, and we will. Um, we will hold the Commission to its word there. Um, it is still 17% in the European Union, it's 21% in Germany. Um, and, and as Andrea said, and we all mentioned, um, women are really carrying the burden in this crisis. And everybody acknowledges that now, but we have to draw the consequences. And, and we do see some progress in social rights. Um, as I said, we have the system in Germany that if you have to shorten your, your working hours because of a crisis, which can be any crisis, then you get um, state aid um, uh, so that you, you can keep your job and the company can still pay you a little, but it keeps its workers and it can re reboost and restart immediately when the crisis is over. So it's a benefit for everyone. And we're going to introduce that now in, in Europe, um, for, for the whole of Europe. Um, we're sticking to, to, um, to implementing the um, minimum wage scheme in, in Europe, which we don't have in every member state. Um, so, so we do, as Social Democrats especially, try to take this crisis as a chance and, and really use this focus that there is at the moment on, on the, the needs of people to improve uh, our legislation. Thank you, Katrin. It's uh, very interesting to see some of the really strong connections between the work that you're both doing on different sides of the Atlantic. And I, I'm hopeful maybe we can uh, bring you together for an update in a, in a few months again. I'm just